they are leopards and pumas in Britain. Yes, I suppose because we're an island, they've got no way off. Yeah, they're in our country, they're here to stay. Seeing is believing, and I have no proof of what I saw that day other than what I can describe. It was huge. It was like the weightlifter of cats. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello, welcome to episode 44 of Big Cat Conversations. We all, I guess, know the song Mull of Kintyre by Paul McCartney and Wings. We are looking at Kintyre because of the recently produced short film Rare Creatures, which you can see on YouTube and also it's linked on our website. Coming up later in the episode are two of the eyewitnesses from Rare Creatures who feature in the film. But first, we are speaking with the film's director, Cameron Nicholl, and Cameron is based in Glasgow. Cameron, congratulations on a really well-made and very watchable short film, and welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Rick. Thanks for having me. And Cameron, a very simple first question, or maybe not. Why did you select this particular subject, and why Kintyre? Well, I kind of came to it by accident, actually. I was thinking about making a film about the Scottish wildcat, which is a species of cat native to Scotland that is sort of a bit chunkier than your domestic house cat. And it's very rare, incredibly elusive. I had this sort of vague idea to go looking for one of those and to kind of explore my relationship with nature in the process and search for some intangible thing. And I put some feelers out and some friends of mine in Kintyre said that they knew someone, an artist, who has all sorts of stories about seeing cats out in the wild and all sorts of other things, in fact. And he sort of goes on these long walks and comes back and paints these fantastical landscapes of the highlands. And I just thought, I've got to meet this man. (laughs) And it sounded incredible. So I went up there as soon as I could to talk to him. And when I got there, I realized that no one was talking about the Scottish wildcat, but something far more interesting, which is this legend of big cats existing in the UK. And uh, I'd never heard about it before. I was just taken by that and talking to this artist who's in the film called, he's called Ralph. I was presented with a story that was far more interesting than the one that I had (laughs) originally set out to do. So it was much more fun for me to pivot to that idea. And I'm sure much more fun for any future viewer who would be watching it. Yeah, not that we want to undervalue the Scottish wildcat. It's a very important, fascinating little creature, which we must do our best yeah, to protect. It's, you know, on the edge, as it were. And we sometimes mention it on these podcasts, and we will be actually giving it some special time in at least half an episode coming up this year. OK, so you got pulled into it, and you'd not heard at all about the mystery of big cats in Britain anywhere, let alone Kintyre. Not at all. And so and when I got there and started talking to people who live there, I was amazed about how many sightings there had been in this just tiny area. And of course, I was immediately like doing frantic research to sort of get acquainted with the, with the whole issue. And I found that there was this whole world that I hadn't encountered before all across the UK. But I had heard just in the couple of days I was there for that first sort of more research-based trip. You know, I heard six or seven separate stories from people in in just the local area about it. Then I was hooked. I guess also in that early introduction to you as a filmmaker from the sort of art sector, it doesn't matter at that stage whether it's mythical, fantastical, really doesn't matter whether they're real or imaginary. It's just an interesting subject. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's absolutely an integral part of it. The fact that there are you know, loads of different perspectives on it. That's basically what made it so interesting to me, the fact that that there is this kind of question mark over it. I thought it was just a great thing to explore. Presumably, though, you did find the eyewitness reports pretty compelling because you got drawn in. If they weren't so compelling, perhaps you wouldn't have been influenced as much as you were? No, absolutely. Talking to people 
as you do every every couple of weeks on your podcast, talking to very reasonable people who have no incentive to make anything up. And people say they must be they could you know, they could be mistaken, it could be a, a dog or a deer or whatever. But you know, actually listening to them, that's not what they've experienced. I just try to take them at their word. In any case, even if I was talking to someone who was mistaken, you know, I don't care because they have experienced something fascinating, and it's their perspective that I'm interested in. The treatment of the film, it's quite subtle, and I suspect it actually won't please everyone, but I think the people, you know, for me, it worked for me, there's some magical sort of ingredient that gives it some kind of distinction. Did you set out knowing what kind of treatment you'd give it? How do you make that decision on something like this? I guess that just probably comes through from my perception of the topic, you know, that kind of hint of something magical that you're talking about. At the core of the film is is this artist who I mentioned before. He does have a sort of more mythical, sort of more fantastical relationship to the natural world and, you know, his perspective on his experience with seeing a big cat. He takes it in a kind of different direction as most of other people who might experience that. I was fascinated by that and fascinated by his relationship to nature and I, I admire it. And so I guess my treatment of it comes from that admiration and from trying to access that more fantastical, magical way of thinking, because it's fun. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to see the world in that way, or at least it was interesting to me that, that that's how he sees it. He does present it as a sort of new mythology, this modern day freaky animal beast that's out there. His artwork depicts that. He's sort of even, I think he's contrived some kind of remains, isn't he, that might be a sort of hidden carcass of one of these animals that might be real or not. So he's very much an artist treating it as a modern day new beast that's out there in our minds and maybe for real, but certainly in our minds. Is that right? Have I read him correctly? Yeah, I think so. I think he's he's not the only one out there to subscribe to this view that it's a prehistoric sort of native creature to the UK. But that was another perspective that I was interested in exploring and especially, you know, how he expresses it through his, his artwork. And it's kind of representative of his whole kind of worldview that he would take this in that way. There's been a lot of, you know, going back hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, there are a lot of, you know, old folk tales that talk about like, the black dog or the you know beasts of the moor and and i think this is a kind of an old mythology still going strong today yeah his sighting which he did have a sighting didn't he which was very credible and which he thought was real but it did inspire him to his artwork which perhaps gives it a more stylized treatment that does tweak what he saw into a modern day beast you start and finish with him and and then you get into the other witnesses can you recall one particular incident, encounter or sighting, which you felt was particularly compelling and intriguing? Well, one of my favourite ones from the film is a woman talking about, she's actually relaying the sighting story of, of her daughter, and it's just captured my imagination. She sets the scene, and it's like a, it's a dark and windy night, and it's pouring with rain, and she's out walking the dogs, and she's by a sort of vast expanse of forestry trees, and her dogs just come across this pair of big cats. And she was not mistaken in, in what she saw. She realized, she, you know, she thought they might be dogs or she realized soon enough that they weren't dogs and sort of quickly retreated to her car, but not before one of them let out a blood curdling scream. And that just something about that, the setting of the scene and the, and the scream. I just love that one. Did you find that witnesses were wary of you at first because they didn't quite know your agenda or they didn't know how you would portray them? How did you get witnesses to open up to you and to trust you that you were going to treat them with respect? I actually didn't find any any difficulty. I felt the people who I approached were very willing and eager, in fact, to talk about their experiences because I feel like you know a lot of them have been doubted and people yeah treat it with sort of suspicion or a bit of a laugh. So I was going to take them at their word and you know treat them with respect. I wasn't out to poke fun at anything or uh, make light of the issue in, in that way. That was quite clear from the offset, so they were very willing to talk to me. 
it actually worked quite well, I think, to have them relaxed on the sofa, as it were. That was um, quite an interesting choice of approach, I thought. Yeah, I thought there would be a bit of a distinction between Ralph, the artist, and everyone else in that way as well. And to see them comfortable at home felt right to me. To have them in a sort of more stable home setting and have Ralph on the windy moor would be a nice contrast. On reflection, what is your personal take on the subject? And and it may be that this is where we could talk about the word of the week, because we've actually decided to, a very sort of blatantly obvious word that we haven't covered on the podcast for word of the week yet, and that is mystery, because um, obviously it's a big aspect of this whole subject. But it might be interesting to have your take on mystery. How have you found the whole thing, uh, and particularly from a mystery side of things? Yeah, I suggested the word mystery because... That's kind of the the part of it that really kind of got me excited about it in the first place. And I love the open-ended nature of it, the fact that it's this story that's been kind of swirling around for, for decades now. And, and, you know, some people, there might be a sort of a heated debate about whether it's true, whether, whether there are really cats out there or whether they're just kind of imagined. But I'm not really sort of concerned with that. I like the mystery. I think mysteries are fun. It kind of connects to this, yeah, this perspective on the world that I kind of saw in in Ralph and really admired, as I was talking about earlier. It's like to see the world as a kind of a place where, you know, anything can happen. And, you know, whether or not you agree with Ralph, with his take on the thing, wouldn't matter to him at all. Uh, as probably the same goes for, for anyone I talked to for the film and probably a lot of people who you've talked to, you know, for that person. They've seen something, they've experienced something that has forced them to reevaluate or sort of to check in with their existing idea about the world that they thought they knew. You know, something that comes completely from outside of your awareness, you know, and suddenly you're confronted with something that challenges your perception of the world. And I thought that that kind of magical moment of mystery was really what I kind of wanted to convey and that's what kind of the worldview that I saw in Ralph and thought was quite beautiful and yeah kind of what I wanted to capture with the film and I wanted myself to try to access that because it's fun. (laughs) It's intriguing that also a landscape like Kintyre can enhance that sense of mystery and, and the atmosphere that goes with it but we've just done a couple of episodes from the urban fringe of Greater London. Great messy Mm. area of utility land and cemeteries and brownfield land and scraggy rough bits along the edges of infrastructure, yet you can still have Mm. the same thing there. You know, we've got that mystery and that uh, wonder coming through of these cats in those locations, not just wild, remote Kintyre. So it it is a sort of all-transcending aspect, perhaps. Exactly. You know, it doesn't matter where you are. I grew up in London and I think, you know, part of my fascination with this topic is because it feels, you know, particularly that part of that remote part of Scotland where the film is was shot, you know, it's just so beautiful to me and so far from what I grew up with. And these days I find myself just wanting to be there all the time, you know. This sense of reality that that gets sort of um, crushed and shattered by seeing one of these cats, experiencing one of these cats, I think that's right, what you said about the worldview and one's perception of the world. And that's maybe why there is such scepticism, is that people hold on to their sense of reality from their upbringing and their values and their comfortable way of life and whatever. And they're not prepared to have that sense of reality challenged and shattered in the way that big cats do. I think that's understandable. You know, it's fair enough in a way. And I think scepticism is healthy and valuable. Absolutely, it's important to question things. But... You know, I feel like, to me, the, the mystery is more interesting than being an absolutist about it. You know, being open to to possibilities is equally important, you know. It keeps it tantalising rather than pushes it to one end or the other. Of the <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sure that can be very infuriating for maybe for maybe even, even yourself, you know, um, and a lot, a lot of people who are in the field hoping that there is some hard evidence We come to terms with it, Cameron. (laughs) (laughs) We've learnt to live with it. (laughs) That's very zen of you, Rick.
Yeah, well, otherwise we don't get to talk to people like you. And well, this brings us on to arts engaging with this subject. It strikes me that it is a very fruitful subject for literature, arts, drama, filmmaking, storytelling. You know, it's it's a rich subject for that, isn't it? We do touch on it uh, in the podcast a bit, but it strikes me that there's scope for plenty more, perhaps. Yeah, well, I'd be interested to hear how you feel like this film sits among the, the landscape of things that are out there. I've seen a few things um, that I've found a kind of maybe do set out with this idea of hoping to to prove it one way or the other, which I sort of tried to steer away from. But of course, I understand that desire. What do you think? What's the general flavor of things that are out there? I saw there was a, a couple of weeks ago, in fact, there was a um, like a tongue in cheek Guardian article about it. You know, it's a kind of one of these stories that keeps on rolling. And I think it, it can provide a nice distraction for people, especially in times like this, you know. We shot the film maybe a month or six weeks before the first lockdown. So then the, for the whole of the first lockdown, I was just working on the film and I found it. I was very fortunate to have that world to escape to in that time. Last year did see a great deal more than usual attention on the subject. I think the press and the media and websites really cottoned onto it and uh, it became a Mm. trending subject. And I think that was partly because it was a bit of escapism in troubled times. We're all feeling a bit beleaguered and we want to escape to something that gets in touch with our deeper emotions. Also, maybe that there was just less celebrity culture around. (laughs) The big cats are very charismatic, aren't they? Black Panthers are very beguiling. So... The various factors, I think, were swirling around and giving it a lot of attention last year. In terms of where do I position rare creatures and similar things, let's say they are real and we are right and there's a a small breeding population. Well, it's not only science that needs to get to grips with that, but I think it's quite a culture shock. And the more that we get a kind of associated folklore we acclimatise to it with the arts contributing to our sort of thinking and discussion about it, I think the better. New predators in our midst should have folklore attached to them, shouldn't they? So I think it's part of the acclimatisation process, if you like. I do feel it's surprising that there aren't storytellers getting in on this. I think it's really ripe for storytelling. Yeah. Well, sooner or later. Yeah, I guess it will happen well, it's interesting that somebody like you, you know, hadn't really been exposed to the subject at all. And so it was very new. I'm interested in that kind of thing. You know, I was surprised that I had it, that it was such a big thing. And it slipped under the radar, but I was very glad to find it in the end. OK. And what kind of feedback are you getting so far on it? All positive feedback so far, thankfully. I think people are liking it. It's hopefully going to do a couple of film festivals up here in Scotland uh, in the coming months. Our relationship to nature and our relationship to to animals is something that has you know fascinated me for a long time. So I'm sure I'll keep coming back to it. And you know I like mysteries, so I'm sure I'll do some more of those. You probably found Cameron, did you, that there were two main cats that were being reported and nothing else. Maybe Lynx reported as well, but you were getting Black Panther and the Sandy Brown Puma reports, were you, from Kintyre? That's right, yeah. You see, you've got that everywhere you go in Britain, and normally around three quarters Black Panther and a quarter tan pumas, cougars, Mm. mountain lions, and you probably found that as well. But you also get normally a, a smattering of Lynx as well, which is our former native cat. Right. So, you, yeah, you couldn't really make that up. And yeah. a huge sample, an ongoing sample, and you've got that. People are not predisposed to dredge those particular cats up from their psyche, that like some people think. Exactly. I came from a professional countryside wildlife background, and the stakes are high in those circles for challenging the worldview, challenging people's sense of reality. And you've got to be very careful, because some people think it's heroic and interesting to talk about it and are with you other people just don't Mm. commit themselves and some other people think it's too maverick and outlandish and they have never been exposed to it and they want to keep their professional status as well so there's all kinds of different tactical aspects of human psychology come into it yeah one of the things that got me interested in the first place was the fact that people can be skeptical about it 
and how someone who has had that experience, who has seen a big cat, you know, would react to that. And a lot of people, you know, said that they felt embarrassed and, uh, you know, didn't want to tell anyone. But I just consider all those people, including yourself, who have had those experiences to be incredibly fortunate. And I hope to have an experience like that myself one day. And of course, you can't contrive it. It either happens or it doesn't. And of course not, yeah. We'll ask the witnesses coming up on the episode now if they'd like to have another sighting. Most people, you know, really crave another one. Even if it was, if it was a bit edgy, you know, so if you're a bit close to one, it's not something you want to repeat, really, actually, because it can be unnerving. There's no way you're going to get your mobile phone mm. camera out and start snapping away if they're too close for comfort. But majority of people <laughs> yeah. do do want to repeat the experience. But yes, your point about the contrast between sceptic and the person who's experienced it, I sometimes encounter that in my information tents at rural shows when I'm, I'm there all day, you know, in a, in a sort of information tent, um, getting reports mm-hmm. and, and showing displays and exhibits on the subject. And normally once a day, at least, you get um, somebody comes in who's a sceptic. I think a lot of the sceptics just stay out or fleetingly come in. And you can always tell by the body language because they sort of parade around the tent as if you're spreading an r- evil religion. And you can just sense that, you know, <laughs> that, that they're sort of tut-tutting and I walk off. But um, a couple of times I've had people really over the top and unreasonable in their um, aggressive assertions that this is madness and ranting mm. away. And I'm very diplomatic and reasonable. You have to be, you know, you can't, you can't treat fire with fire on that and lose your rag. Often there's, you know, other people in the tent and twice that's happened. And the next person who spoke to me as that other person went off had a fantastic encounter to relay and talk about. And on both occasions, I said to them, and you didn't want to relay it to that person who's just left. And they said, no, no way. And it was almost like that person's mm. unreasonable scepticism didn't deserve to have their full-on, um, very credible encounter. So I think there's also an issue of people will find you out if they trust you and think you believe them which is nice Mm -hmm. in a way, uh, but, of course, then the counterpoint to that is you could become too gullible if you're getting this all the time and you're immediately believing everything. So you've got to trust people, but you've also got to have a little tick box about whether it is actually plausible, although the majority of them, in my view, are. But you're you're still having to do that kind of validation. It can be tough on the evidence, so... Any good subject should have that. It's just about being objective. Uh, People say, oh, we've got to be scientific. Well, I think it's just about being objective because you could be scientific but also biased. And I think you've just got to try and rule out bias however you play the subject. Yeah, and I guess the more more that it's featured in the media, the more you might get, well, the more you might get on on both sides, sceptical bias and sort of more errant reports of, of sightings, you know. Yeah, I think the um, the degree of detail and and the subtle detail with a, with a good credible report is is hard to invent. I think, and people are used to me saying that on the podcast. And I think a lot of the podcast witnesses, people can sense that you know how on earth could you actually completely contrive that degree of detail, and and often that sort of mm. small scale personal embarrassment or little incidental mundane things that are happening to you as you're being a witness that you report along with the incident. Mm-hmm. And also some of the detail, like um, the big feet, the big paws, or the higher at the back end, you know, things like that. You know, if you're inventing the subject and just want to take the mick or whatever, you just don't notice things like that. Th- yeah. Those are important features of these animals, which are pretty much correct. And also dogs and horses. You, know, you had some on the show on your film and we'll talk about it with the witnesses at least george coming up i think you know the dog's reaction reinforcing the human sighting so if mm-hmm. if humans are getting it wrong well so are their dogs and their horses <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you for your uh, take on it cameron and uh, well done again and good luck with promoting it further in the film festivals and keep in touch and uh, thanks ever so much for coming on big cat conversations Well, thanks so much, Rick. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Lovely. All the best, Cameron.
Our next guest is one of the witnesses who appears in Rare Creatures, and we welcome George, and George is from Clacken in the mid part of Kintyre. George, thanks for coming on the podcast. You're welcome. And George, the incident we're going to hear about was in 2014, was it? Yeah, roughly, yeah. It was either 13 or 14. Okay. Well, we've got plenty of points to ask you, George, but first, could we ask you to summarise what happened when you had that encounter? Well, it was just about 8, 9 o'clock at night. I usually take the dog out about that time, and we went for a walk, as usual, and we got along towards the end of the road at the school, and there's a bit of an old road that's closed off that comes down to the west side of the, the village. We happened to look over, and I saw something move, but I didn't think anything of it, and the dog started growling. So I kind of looked around, looked around, and he wouldn't go any further. So I'm pulling him along, and I'm going, come on, behave yourself, move yourself. And just as we got about 20 yards from the wall where the school ends, the cat came right down the hill from my left-hand side and started to walk right down the wall, and it just stopped didn't look at me, didn't do anything. For it slopped for a fleeting second and then it just carried on again. And the dog just growled and snarled at it. And I get such a fright. It's a sensation that you can't explain. It's a kind of surrealism. You feel like, God, what's happened to you? And then you get the way, did it actually happen? And I was looking around for a brick to pick up, to throw at it in case it turned on me. And when I picked up the brick, I looked around and it walked right down past me and I went in the night. And I walked right round about a couple of minutes. I gave it a couple of minutes and I walked right round and I couldn't see it. It was away. But it was so scary. It was an experience. At the time, I'd say I wouldn't want to happen, but since I've thought about it and got myself, you know, into the way of thinking, I would like to see it again. On safe terms. Yeah. But there was this funny incident after it. Maybe a couple of weeks after, I was speaking to somebody, but I didn't tell them exactly what happened. They were telling me about an incident that they had, and it was very similar. But you're trying to tell them about the story to make it that it's true, because you feel that if you tell somebody that, they think you're making it up. That was the hard part, trying to tell them. Yeah. So your dog, and your dog's called Bruce, is that right? Yeah. He's a wee Cairn Terrier. He's from Dundee. He's now 14, but about six or seven years old at the time. And he's on the film. We can see a snippet of him briefly when you're interviewed. Yeah. He sensed it before you, yeah? Yeah, definitely. It was something that drew my attention. After I saw this, something moving on my left-hand side coming down the hill, I didn't even think anything of it because you got all sorts of things in the country, but I wasn't thinking it was anything like what I've seen. I want to make sure that people understand it was definitely a cat. It wasn't a, a dog or a sheep. Well, can you describe the cat? Can you describe the animal as best you can? I had a big kind of longish tail, quite a long body, and it was kind of darkish purpley coloured. And its tail curled a wee bit at the end, and it was very slink, you know, like slinking down and up and down and up all the way down the road. And then when it stopped... What surprised me that it didn't look round. It just stopped and then just carried on again. That was surprising because I thought it might have turned on the dog or me or growled. or It didn't even make a noise. You know, it didn't even startle me that way. But it was scary. It was illuminated by streetlights or something, was it? Yeah, there was two or three lights on the hill coming down. That's where I get that purple glazy colour. It was a funny colour. It really was. In daylight, what do you think the colour would have been? Black. Very dark. It wasn't brown or anything. No strikes, no nothing, no marks on it. But a friend of mine, when I eventually did bring it out that I'd seen it and we were speaking about it, says to me, what would you have done if it had turned on you? What would you have done? And me being from Glasgow and having a sense of humour, I said I would have just threw the dog at it. <laughs> That actually cues my next question. Did it take any interest in Bruce the dog? No, no, it didn't look round at all. It just looked straight ahead. That was the strangest thing. Because after it, I thought to myself, you know, when you analyse it, you don't think of anything when it's happening. 
But when you sit down and have a cup of tea, you know, and you think about it and you talk about it to your wife, you say to yourself, God, I never did this, I never done that. It's so strange, you know. If you had to sort of sum up its attitude. Very placid and it was like it was it didn't want to be seen because it was right up against the wall and it was dark. It wasn't taking in the fact that there was street lights there, I don't think. You know, it was coming down and it was doing its thing. And where we stay is not a lot of people stay here. It's quiet and at that time of night you're lucky if you see anybody. And no cars about? No. Very, very little traffic. So and it's an old road that it had come from. And up when you got on to the top of the road, it's just all farms, plenty of open space for it. So I think that's where it had come from. But why it came into the village, I don't know. Obviously, you heard of sightings after this, but had you heard of sightings before this incident? Yes, I did, yeah. I heard about three different people who told me stories. One was a, a big house, and it's a way up the top. It was... Two young fellas were out walking. One of them was kidding, and he says, it'd be great to see this big cat that everybody's speaking about. They got to the incline of the hill just as you go up, and right on the top of the hill there was a cat. And one of them says, stop, it's not a cat, and they'd run all the way around the hill at the back end of it, and they saw the cat running down the hill at the other side, right in this same area, but that was about, say, a year and a half after me. When you had the incident yourself, was it a complete shock or had you heard of other sightings before yours? Oh, before mine, I do apologise. No. So that added to the surprise, presumably? Yeah, I got a bit of a shock, yeah. After it happened, you want to tell people. You feel like you're, you know, you get embarrassed about it. Once you open up and talk about it and tell people, I was quite surprised at the acceptance of it. Okay. You know what I mean? In the village, it was like, at first I thought, they're going to say, you must have had a couple of drinks, you know, things like that. But I said, no, it's quite nice to see the rest of the village sort of believe in you. Did you find that some people found it scary that you'd reported a big, black, large carnivore around the village? I wouldn't say scary, but where it came down the hill, and it went along the wall. There's a house there, and they're good friends of ours. I didn't tell Cathy for a, a year after it. She's got two big white dogs, and she says, I wish you would have told me, George, and I could have remembered if the dogs were barking. I said, I didn't want to say. I was quite embarrassed about it. Our listeners are used to that kind of human reaction. At that time, did any people's pets go missing? Did any cats or dogs go missing? No, but there's another boy on the film that was done, Ralph, and he found a sheep's carcass up a tree. Okay. And he also found a couple of sheep's carcasses that had been very badly savage six months after I seen it. Did you start looking up in reference books or looking up on websites about large black cats like you saw? No, I didn't, no. If you had to have summarise the type of cat you saw? What were you saying to people? Well, I was just saying it was a big leopard. I think it was more or less leopard. I used to keep saying that's what it looked like to me, you know. It looked panther-like and leopard. Both words are appropriate. You know, in Malay Peninsula, where you get black leopards, they call them panthers more than leopards, the local people. So it goes by both words, and it's like Bargira in the Jungle Book. Yeah. (laughs) Did you see the length of the tail? Yeah, it was long. Yeah, it was that was a fair size. And it had a kind of curl to it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that means when they walk like that. Very slinky. And its paws were kind of bent at the front, if you know what I mean. As if it was kind of crouching down a wee bit. When it stopped, I thought, it's going to turn or it's going to run or it's going to do something. But no, it just stood there for that split time and then it carried on again. Yeah, so it was very aware of you and Bruce, the dog. Yeah, it definitely saw It must have saw me. You know, it wasn't that far from it. And the dog just kept growling and growling. But he never barked, he just growled. Had you ever seen Bruce, the dog, react like that precisely before? No. No, he only does it if it's another dog, like a wee dog or something comes up, you know, maybe give a growl and carry on. 
but it's nothing like he was doing. He was actually, you know, going crazy. For how long was he reacting and growling before you saw the cat? And for how long did you see the cat after that? As we started to walk along at the end of the school, I would say a good couple of minutes, he was growling. Without you knowing what the reason was? That's what I said. I stopped. I'm going, come on, hurry up, you know, behave yourself. I thought he was just growling for whatever reason. You don't know what's around. It was just when I turned and saw it, I said, oh, my God. I was glad to get back into the house, I'll tell you. It was quite scary. How did it feel the first time you heard somebody else mention that they'd seen one as well? I was very relieved and quite happy that I wasn't alone because you feel like you're on your own and you've seen it and nobody else has seen it. Because I think it's a thing, the situation that's created by a big cat, it's not going to be a thing that's going to walk down the main street and 40 people's going to see it. But it's always going to be an isolated incident. It was good to have the experience. You know, I feel quite privileged to have seen it because uh, there's a lot of people that may never happen to them. To see it just walking down the street nonchalant. How physically close was it to you both? I would say about 30 feet. As I said, if I had thrown the dog, <laughs> I would have ran the other way while I did it. <laughs> but, uh, no. So now you know that there's been several other witnesses and the cougar, mountain lion type cat, has been seen in Kintyre as well. What's your view and what do you find neighbours and other members of the community's view? Do the views vary or is there an attitude that you sort of pick up? It doesn't bother me, not one bit. If I was a farmer or I had cattle or sheep or something, I maybe be thinking it's a bit dangerous. But to be out and about at night, I still go out late at night when it's dark because the dog has to go out and uh, sometimes I go out at midnight. And I still think every now and again that there's a farm right about 40 feet from the house and I walk along the other wall and I still have a wee look over the wall every now and again, you know, just to see if there's anything about there. But I've never ever seen it again. But in relation to how I feel, it doesn't bother me. I've no fear of it, you know. What about other people's attitudes? Well, nobody's ever said, you know, they think it's dangerous or they feel that there's any danger in going out or anything like that. It's pretty positive, actually. And another thing, there'll be people coming or hear about this and maybe want to come and see it and maybe try and find it. But I don't know how long they live. They live longer in zoos, in captivity, because they don't have such a tough life unless you know, yeah. they get some kind of illness. But uh, the textbooks can say up to 20 years, but I think that's a bit pushing it. I think it's more like 12 to 15 years in the wild. Looking at that big cat, it was very mature. It wasn't a, a young thing. It didn't you know, it looked quite big and I've seen stacks of wild cats. The small Scottish wildcat, you mean? Yeah, the Scottish wildcats, yeah, with ring tail. There's hundreds of them here. Hundreds. They won't be pure ones, will they? They'll be mixed. There's very few pure ones. Yeah, there's domestic cats get caught with them and they're all over the shop. They're quite intimidating. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard they've got quite a gnarly spirit to them, which is good for them in a way. There used to be a boy in Macrahanish, about 25 miles from here. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to go, he used to have a crossbow, and he used to kill them. The farmers used to give him payment for every cat he killed because they were a nuisance. There's a bounty system. Yeah. He obviously had a licence for it. That was maybe about 20 years ago. That, that will stop. You're not in an area with known pure ones, are you? And that certainly would have been frowned upon even then, I think, if he was dispatching. Everybody used to be quite scared of him. What did you think about Cameron making the film? Were, were you a bit wary at first? Yeah, I was a bit... I didn't even want to go on film. I didn't even mind like, putting my voice to something. But putting your face out there and telling people these sort of things... I was a wee bit wary of the reaction of the villagers because it's a small community. There's only 250 people in the village. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows everybody, you know, and they know most of your personal things. So to go and film and say these things to people, you're saying it to the whole village because 
it went on everything clacking, you know, on the internet. And everybody's seen it. But the reaction was pretty good. And Cameron done a great job on it. I mean, I must admit, I couldn't fault it. And it was very honest. That's what got me. I liked the honesty of it. It was, it was just that people, it got everybody to speak honestly. It wasn't putting words in people's mouths or trying to tell them. It didn't doubt them. It was very honest and very professionally done and in a caring way. He took his time and listened. He didn't speak a lot, but he put a lot into it, if you know what I mean. The people here, they don't like telling people the business and what's going on. And it was nice to see how he could bring people out and speak about things that normally you wouldn't tell people. That was the thing that I found quite good. And has it helped you meeting other people since then? You know, you, you yeah. got to know of other people and sort of swap notes. That must be interesting in itself. You know, I've got a good friend and he's uh, he goes hunting deer and all that kind of stuff. Roy, he comes from London. When he talks about when he's out hunting and, you know, he's stalking deer and all the rest of it, he's never seen nothing. When I told him about this, he says, yeah, Jamie begging you. How did you manage to see that? He's now 74. He's been doing it since he was about 20. He's never seen a wildcat. But you have heard of other people as foresters and stalkers who have seen them now, presumably, in Kintyre. I've heard of one, one boy. He had a caravan in the forest. He uh, used to stay in it because travelling home, it was too far to get back at night. And they couldn't get digs, so he just put a caravan up next to where they were working. And he was having his tea. I think it was about the same time of night. He heard the sort of rustling and whatever, and he ran out and he saw the cat running right through the bushes. And when he described it, it was the same sort of colour and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's quite hard when you're talking to somebody about it, how you want to get across to them. The truth of it and the feeling of it, and once you tell them and they walk away, you get a feeling of, they don't believe me, or, you know, they think I'm making it up, or of, and I say to myself, you know, but they do believe you, because they've told somebody else, and that person will meet you and say, oh, John was telling me about your incident with the cat, and they say it in a nice way, and they don't make a mockery. So you've got the vibe that they did feel respectful about what you said? Yeah, that's important to me. Yeah, it does test our comfort zones. I think that's part of the challenge of the subject. Once it happens, it's just difficult when you're trying to tell people. Yeah, because also other people can't relate to it, really, can they? That's what I mean. That's what I was trying to get to you. It's like you're telling them something that they've never experienced, so you've not got a, a feedback. You know, like if you're telling somebody something you've done and they've done it, they don't understand what you're talking about. When you tell them something that they've never had, you know, I've never experienced, it leaves you kind of thinking, you know, did I believe me? Is it true? Is it? There is a view, isn't there, that some were released in Kintyre? I've not really heard anything. There's a sort of hint that, you know, there's cages people have found. Were these cages uh, that are at the tip of the peninsula? That was in the front. It would make sense, wouldn't it, if people drove from Glasgow to dump them? When they were dumped, there was going to be a founder population going back some some time that were ones that were released, uh, probably released more than escaped. And maybe Kintyre Peninsula would be a, a relevant place, although you've got the whole of the wild, remote parts of Scotland everywhere else. But driving three hours round from Glasgow to the tip of the peninsula, the Mull of Kintyre, in fact, might be something that people would think about, or deep in the forests throughout Kintyre. If you think about Glasgow, when you come out of Glasgow, about 26 miles from Glasgow, Loch Lomond's there. Yeah. And once you hit Loch Lomond, from there all the way down here is our countryside. They could let the cat go at any point after Loch Lomond, as soon as they get to Loch Lomond. Very sparse populations on woodland and farms and, you know, there's stacks of food. Plenty of deer for the cats. Plenty of deer, get the stacks. A deer killed every day where we stay. Well, on the road, you mean? Yeah. There's... Yeah. There's hundreds every year get killed down here. There's more accidents with deer than what there is with vehicles. You've got ferries all over. You know, from Arran, you've got two ferries from Arran come here. Yeah, well, I hope to do that one day. 
but um, not with a big cat in in a cage. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, don't do that. If uh, there was a sort of policy, I think it'd be very difficult to afford and very difficult to implement. But if there was an agenda to say, right, we know there's some big cats in Kintyre and like panthers and cougars, and we're actually going to have a plan to eradicate them, how would you feel about no, that? But, oh no, definitely not. No, I feel that it would be quite. You know, I think it's quite a nice thing to have a big cat. They're not doing any harm, and most animals won't do you any harm. We are more inclined to do harm, you know. You think your neighbours and community members would largely agree, do you? Yeah, we've actually had a conversation about that with two or three people, and yeah, everybody's in the same frame of mind. I would love to see all sorts of animals, and they're not talking about bringing back one of the smaller cats. The lynx, yeah, the Eurasian lynx. The lynx, yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of things I'd love to see back here. I think it's a beautiful thing. Where we stay here, we could get down, we've got otters and seals and all sorts of things. Because they, they tend to, where well, there's a lot of seaweed, and they're very difficult to see. And you just see the wee splash now and again, then all of a sudden there's a wee group of them. So it's lovely, it's really good. And then you've got seals on the rocks, the cross phase. It's absolutely gorgeous. I think that a big cat enhances that, if you know what I mean. It makes it more more appealing. I mean, I know if I was travelling anywhere and somebody says, oh, there's a big cat being seen there. Well, great. I'll put a tent up and sit for a few hours if I was younger. Yeah, it sort of reinforces the brand of the wildness, does it? Yeah, that's what Scotland is. It's, you know, it's, such a, it's that type of place. Roy and I have been out with a car and we've been 10 feet for a deer just standing looking at you. It just looks at you and then runs, and it's a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. Yet the deer need culling, of course, and the cats can help with that. And that's why he goes out. He's done that all his life. As a stalker, is he OK about big cats? Yeah. That's all been very useful. Thanks ever so much for reliving it for us and, and repeating that honesty that you were talking about earlier. Is there anything else you want to say to the podcast listeners before we close? Yeah, I'd just like to say I hope they experience the same experience I've had in it and seeing this big cat and to get the sensation that it gives you when it happens. It's just been quite uh, scary and enjoyable at the same time. So I hope they get the same, I hope that when it happens to them, they get the same feeling I had. A sort of unique emotion. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm dying to see it again. So it's just one of these things. I know people say you must be off your head, but I'd love, I'd, I'd give my right arm to have the same thing again. And you trust that cat to behave in the same way, would you? Well, I would hope that the cat... <laughs> no, the cat, was, the cat was the problem. It was just a great experience, and I just hope that somebody else, when it happens to them, it's, it's the same feeling that, you know, it, it, there's no use me saying to somebody, don't get frightened or don't do this and don't do that, because I didn't know what to do, and I've no advice on what to do when it happens to them. So, Other than don't pick a fight? <laughs> well, just don't, I don't know, just don't make it scared of you or make it alert. But no, no, just enjoy it, that's it. Another thing I'd like to say is don't be afraid to tell anybody if you ever see one. Okay, from your experience? Yeah, because you're only holding back something that, that's happened in your life that everybody should know about. And it's just a good thing to do is just to tell people about it. That's it. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it's terrific that we, we've been able to sort of explore a bit of the Rare Creatures film a bit further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great for Kintyre and yourselves as a community and for Cameron yeah. for doing the film. It seems that, you know, it's getting a very good reaction. It's a very high quality piece of work. Yeah. Well, I'm threatening a visit sometime. So Definitely. In normal times, we want to do more episodes from a pub where we've got a few people around a table chatting about it. So maybe we'll do one. So might see you in the future, George. So There's that nice big hotel just up from us. You know, if everything clears up this virus and things like that, we're good. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, George. And thanks for coming on Big Cat Conversations. All the best. Thank you. Take care.
OK, we've a little bit more on Kintyre, but it's got to come from me, because alas, we didn't manage to get a recording link with another proposed guest, Rachel, in Carradale. After two attempts, our kit just wouldn't work with Rachel's landline, so I'm going to summarise her very interesting encounter. You can see Rachel on Rare Creatures talking about what she called the cougar, and she told me the incident happened in 1994, driving back home from the creamery where she worked in cheesemaking. During the journey, the cougar appeared alongside the remote road and it loped alongside her car. She described it as a beautiful animal, at least a metre long in the body, with a long thick tail and sandy coloured. She went slow so it could keep alongside her car and she said if she'd opened the window she could have stretched out and touched it. Amazingly, it kept with the car for three minutes this paralleling of a slow-moving car is very interesting behaviour from a cat, and I've heard of it via reports from two other friends who have also taken similar-sounding incidents from drivers in the past. Rachel wondered if this cat had done some similar car-side action with an owner in the past, although she also said it seemed a healthy, wild-looking cat. So what this actual behaviour is all about, other than curiosity, remains a key question. And pumas and leopards are not built for stamina, and they certainly couldn't run at full speed for three minutes, and they need to stop for breaths if they do run. But obviously they can sprint in short bursts for ambushing and for fleeing away. At that time, back in 1994, Rachel heard about other reports of a cougar or puma in the area, including from a local farmer, and he said he was tolerant of it. Rachel was also aware of cages found in local forests, which people assumed were the source of released cats. Even today, Rachel keeps in touch with the local grapevine on any sightings, especially amongst people like foresters and rangers who are outdoors a lot in their jobs. She says there are no known reports of big cats in the area at the moment. So many thanks to Rachel and to her contacts for that final snippet. And as we close our main feature on Kintyre, Cameron, by the way, is on Instagram and you can find him on at Cam Nickel. If you've not seen the Kintyre film, Rare Creatures, we've linked it on the Big Cat Conversations website on the Refs and Links page, episode 44, and it's hosted free on YouTube, so just do a search for Rare Creatures, Big Cats in Britain, and you should find it. For our next episode, our guests are from Suffolk, we will have an overview of past reports in the county from the very experienced Matt Salisbury. And our second guest is someone who's had three sightings. And in total, he has witnessed all three of the main candidate cats, a panther, puma and also lynx. So it's the east of England next time. Beyond that, I'm pleased to say that we've now got an episode on Ireland on the schedule. That one will have two different witness reports from different parts of the Republic and it should be with you in March. Also coming up soon, we'll be meeting Tom in Leicester, hearing about his encounter at the edge of a country park on the fringes of the city of Leicester. Tom's incident has just been in some tabloid newspaper websites. Tom had been discussing it with me, and it does appear he did encounter at least two cats dragging away a fox as prey. So we'll hear directly from Tom all about that encounter in a few episodes' time. Righto, we are signing off now. I hope it's all been useful and thank you for your company. Till next time, take care and all the best. <laughs>